Chapter 20. Nan. How was school today? Mum asked. School was over and we were driving back home. I sighed and looked out the windscreen. Complicated, I replied at last. Ah, Mum didn't say anything else and she didn't ask why. To be honest, for once I wouldn't have minded if she'd asked me to explain. On the way home I tried a couple of times to tell her about what Julie had said. More than once I tried to tell her about me and Marlon, but the right moment and the right words never really presented themselves. When we got home there was a crowd of about 20 people, a definite improvement. At the expression on my face, Mum said, yes I know, by the end of the week let's hope they'll all be gone. With a policewoman's help we managed to reach, out, reach our house without too much pushing and shoving. At least on this front things were getting better. I walked into the living room where I got a wonderful surprise. Nan! Cameron, you goose, how are you? Nan threw down the magazine she was reading, sprang off the sofa and gave me a big hug. I was so pleased to see her that I, that I let her. So what's all this about you having a pig's innards in your chest? Nan thumped the back of her hand against my chest. And why do I have to buy the Daily Press to find out what's going on with my own grandson? We told you Cam was going to have a heart transplant, Mum tried. You didn't say where the heart was coming from though, did you? Mum sighed. I've been getting grief of that, grief of that all day. I made the mistake of trying to explain. Nan, we couldn't tell anyone. Dr Bryce told us not to. And just when did I become anyone? I mean, Nan, not anyone. Mother, don't start again, please, Mum pleaded. And we did phone you as soon as the story hit the newspapers. <sighs> Nan sniffed. It was a little bit late by then, don't you think? When Mum looked suitably contrite, Nan softened a little. A very little. Anyway, I saw all of you on the telly and I saw the crowds outside your house. You obviously need me here. With you here, we don't need the police, I murmured. Nan smiled. Thank you, Cameron. I think. I'd forgotten she had ears like a bat and eyes like a spy satellite. Not much got past my Nan. She was looking more tired than the last time I'd seen her, though. I looked at her, really looked at her. For the first time, she appeared, well, old. She seemed smaller and more fragile. Her shoulders dropped, and even when she smiled, it was as if a sigh wasn't too far away. Mum moved over to the sofa and picked up Nan's magazine. I saw her shake her head. She held it up behind Nan's back for me to see. It was a magazine about coffins. Nan, why are you reading that? I asked, pointing, pointing to it in distaste. Nan turned to see what I was talking about. Cam, I'm no spring chicken anymore and I have to think about these things. I'm going to be in my coffin for a long time so I want to make, make sure I pick one out that's comfortable. Mum shook her head even more at that. I know I should have been used to Nan by now, but I still thought the idea was really morbid. Right, well, I'll leave you two to it. I'm off to do some food shopping, said Mum, leaving the room. I think we'll see about getting our phone number changed as well, seeing as how the number has been leaked to the press. Nan took my arm and we went over to the window. In your fan club, she said dryly. You should attach a garden hose to the cold tap in the bathroom and let them all have it. OK, Mum, drive safely. Bye, Mum, from the hall. Mum called out the things I suppose I should have said to her. Bye, Mum, I called back. <laughs> Mum guffawed. She retrieved her car keys from the hall table and heard, her, heard, and I heard her front door open and close. Nan sat down on the sofa, then patted the space next to her. I sat down eagerly. So, how are you doing, she asked, without preamble. Fine, I guess, I answered lightly. Nan gave me a look. This is your Nan you're talking to, not your mum and dad. I'll ask you again. How are you doing? I sighed and I slumped back on the sofa. I suppose I'm all right. I've never been healthier. I've never felt so fit. But, but suddenly everything seems so complicated, I admitted. In what way? Did Mum tell you, tell you we were offered a lot of money for our story? Yes. And what do you think of that? I think your Mum and Dad should take the money and run. If the papers are stupid enough to offer that kind of money, then I will grab it with both hands. I appreciate your mum's reasons. They were offering a whole lot of money. I couldn't keep the wistful note out of my voice. That's because they have more money than sense, Nan said scathingly. We sat in silence for a while, but it wasn't an uneasy silence. Nan knew that there was more coming. She was just letting me tell it in my own time. Dr Bryce made us promise not to tell anyone about my operation, I began at last. Not even you, although mum and dad wanted to. The only thing we could tell anyone was that I was having a heart transplant. We couldn't say where the heart was coming from, but I told my best friend Marlon. He promised he wouldn't tell anyone else, but, but that's how it got to the papers. I nodded. 
Marlon says his dad told the papers, and then Marlon shouldn't have blabbed to his mum. Sorry, but Marlon shouldn't have blabbed to his mum and dad in the first place. You mean the way you shouldn't have blabbed to Marlon in the first place? Nan asked. That's different, I said at once. How so? It was my secret to tell, I said, annoyed. It wasn't Marlon's. True. There, I knew you'd understand, I said, relieved. Understand what? Today was the first time I've seen Marlon since my operation, and... Well, we argued this morning, and we've barely said five sentences to each other since. Who's not talking to whom? I guess I'm not talking to him, I admitted. Why? I just told you why, I frowned. I could feel Nan's sympathy for my point of view evaporating. Because he made a mistake, Nan raised her eyebrows. It's a bit more than that, I protested. <clears throat> Nan sighed. Cameron, in this life you'll find that when you get right down to it, things are rarely as complicated as they seem. It seems to me quite simple, really. Your friend made a mistake. Something we all do, including you. You now have to decide if you're going to spend the rest of your life bearing a grudge or not. And believe me, life is too short for that kind of nonsense. Even at my advanced years, life is too short. I stared at Nan. Was that really what I was doing? I don't bear grudges. Glad to hear it, said Nan. Don't start either. So did anything else happen today? I looked at Nan and shook my head. Now that the moment had arrived, I didn't want to tell her about Julie. I didn't want to tell anyone. <coughs> just thinking about it did funny things to my insides. After the operation, I thought I'd be, just, I'd be just like everyone else. That was my whole reason for doing it. Only I hadn't realised that some people like Julie and her mum might think otherwise. I thought about the times before the operation, every time I looked up from my desk and Julie was there smiling at me. I think Marlon was right. Julie had liked me before my operation. Now all that had changed. It was strange the way things worked out. Come on, Cam, don't get too comfy. We have dinner to make. Nan leapt to her feet. I followed more slowly. I had a lot to think about. Nan, I said as she headed out of the door. Yes, dear. I'm glad you're here. Of course you are, Nan smiled. And it seems to me I arrived only just in time. When we got to the kitchen, Nan started by investigating the fridge. I think some of my fried chicken... Some baked potatoes and veggies ought to do the trick. You're fried chicken, I asked suspiciously. Does that involve just taking some chicken out of a packet and putting it in the oven? Or is there chopping and slicing and dicing involved? Taking some chicken out of a packet? Nan was scandalised. I don't think so. Can I watch, I asked, hoping Nan wouldn't spot what I was trying to do. No, you can help, she replied at once. You may be smart, child, but I'm smarter. Worth a try. The first thing you can do though, said Nan, is change the light bulb in the spare bedroom for me. I want to see where I'm going when I go to bed tonight, if I end up sleeping on the windowsill. Okay, Nan, I said, glad to get out of the cooking. Now all I had to do was drag out changing the light bulb for an hour or so until the worst was over. I want you back down here in five minutes, maximum, said Nan. Or I'll come upstairs to fetch you and you don't want that. Are you reading my mind or something? I asked, impressed. Nan laughed. Now if I told you that, you'd know as much as I do. I went over to the light bulb drawer. When I opened it, it was like opening a jack-in-the-box. Letters and more letters sprang out of it, falling to the floor. Huffing impatiently, I squatted down to pick them up. Let me do that, Nan said quickly. It's okay, I've got them. I waved her off. No, Cameron, you go and change the light bulb. I frowned up at Nan. She was nervous, agitated. What was her problem? Did she think that my new heart might collapse with the strain of squatting down? I smiled to reassure her. Nan, I'm here now. It'll only take me two seconds. And Dr. Bryce didn't say anything about bending down. As I reached out for a handful of the papers, I caught sight of my name on one of the letters, so I picked it up and read it. And I wish I hadn't. L-E-P-A-R. League for the Protection of Animal Rights. Mr. and Mrs. Kelsey, we at, Le at Lepar find you totally immoral and despicable. How could you condone the suffering of innocent animals? Because that's what you've done by allowing your son Cameron to have the heart of a pig transplanted into his body. Pigs are intelligent animals with thoughts and feelings, just like ourselves. Would you feel it right to have humans bred for the sole purpose of being killed to allow others to use their organs? If it's not right for humans, why do you feel that such action is right and correct for animals? We understand your concern for your son. Heart disease is a terrible affliction, but it's your attempted solution that we find so reprehensible. I didn't read any more, I couldn't. I picked up another of the letters. It was even worse. Rage, anger and spilling from every word the page. I picked up another and another. Threats and more threats made against me. 
against mum and dad, against our house, against our car. It was horrible. Some of the letters accused mum and dad of owing letting me have the operation so they could cash in on the resulting publicity. Some were from animal lovers who sympathised with mum and dad's position but asked if they'd explored all the options. Some were actually from people wishing as well but there were very few and far between. Most were just nasty. Profoundly shocked, I looked up at Nan. Have you seen these? I asked. Some of them, Nan admitted. They're today's batch of letters. I read some of them when I arrived this morning. I didn't know your mum would put them in there. I wish you told me. Today's batch, I stared. You mean we get these every day? Every single day. But why did mum and dad keep them? I looked down at the pile of letters again. It couldn't have been more loathsome if it had been a pile of horse manure on the kitchen floor. The police advise them to keep the worst ones just in case someone tries something. So each night, when you're in bed, they go through them. I picked up another. No, Cameron, put it down. Don't read any more. Nan ordered gently. These people hate me. They don't even know me and they hate me. What have I ever done to them? I said, bewildered. Cameron, it's not you. It's what you represent. You mustn't take it personally. But how could I take it any other way? These people really hated me and mum and dad for what we'd done. I shook my head. Why didn't mum and dad tell me? What for? Why upset you too? Can't the police do something about them? Like what? People are perfectly free to post letters wherever and whenever they please in this country, said Nan. Do people really believe that mum and dad only let me have the operation for the money they could make? I asked, appalled at the very idea of it. Some do. Your dad has had to put with a lot of nonsense at work and your mum reckons the company on the verge of letting her go. They keep getting inundated with people trying to get in touch with her. But she's not going back until next week. Well, these people... Either don't know that, or don't believe it, or just don't care, said Nan. She bent down to pick up the letters, some still in their envelopes, most just crumpled sheets of paper. That's why Mum and Dad wouldn't take the money. Those two newspapers offered, isn't it, I realised, because then all the people who accuse them of just doing it for the money would think they were right. Your Mum and Dad wouldn't have taken that money, no matter what the circumstances, Nan told me firmly. We stuck the letters back in the drawer. Nan took out a light bulb before firmly pushing the drawer shut. Now, I believe you're going to change my light bulb. She handed the bulb to me. I nodded and turned to leave the room. Cameron? Yes, Nan. Don't let it get you down, OK? I forced a smile as I left the kitchen, thinking it was much too late for that. Thousands and thousands of people out there didn't know anything about us except what they'd read in newspapers. And yet to them, we were the scum of the earth. And Julian and Mum were among them. I told myself not to mind, not to let them get to me. But I'd be lying if I said that. At that moment, I didn't feel like shouting at the top of my voice or kicking something.